We want to extend a huge thank you to all of you who generously responded to the 2023 spring campaign. If this is your first gift, thank you. If this is your 10th or 15th or 30th gift, thank you. And if you give monthly as a sustainer, we say thank you. And thanks to your generosity, we exceeded our $50,000 goal for the campaign. What else can we say? Y'all are, are amazing and thank you. We know you rely on Working Preacher and we are grateful that you took the time to let us know what this ministry is worth to you. So thank you for keeping Working Preacher working for you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And welcome to the second Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on June 11th, 2023. The first reading, or the thematic Old Testament reading, is Hosea 5, 15 through 6, 6. You might instead choose the semi-continuous reading, which begins this Sunday, Genesis 12, 1 through 9. The psalm we'll be discussing is Psalm 50, 7 through 15. The second reading, which is the fourth I've named here, but the uh, the epistle reading, Romans 4, 13 through 25. And from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 9, verses 9 through 13, and then verses 18 through 26. So we should probably begin with a reorientation of where we are, given we coming off of Easter and Holy Trinity Sunday, and now we're in the season of Pentecost, ordinary time. We're back in the Gospel of Matthew. I mean, we were last week, but now we're going to be working through Matthew's story of the ministry of Jesus. We have now added the semi-continuous reading, uh, Old Testament reading, which takes us through Genesis beginning this Sunday through August 20th, and then pick up in Exodus in uh, August 27 and 15 Sundays in Romans. <laughs> so preachers have quite a few options then for how to move through the summer. And so that's just one thing that we, I think we just want to want to point out is plenty to plenty to do this summer and a direction you can take and a, and and a focus you can have if if you're so inclined homiletically inclined but we'll start with Matthew it's your call story you tax collector you it is this is the best of all of the calling stories when it comes to disciples <laughs> because Matthew is just minding his own business, doing his job, oppressing his neighbors, and Jesus comes up and encounters him, says, follow me. He got up and followed him. There's not a lot of fuss. Matthew doesn't complain. Matthew just does what he's told. And then the next thing Matthew does is he throws a party. He has, invites all of his tax collector and sinner friends over. So who doesn't want to hang out with a guy like that? <laughs> exactly. And then yeah. I don't think he ever really talks or does anything else. He just minds his own business and resides in the background. Can you relate in some way to that? No, yeah. not really. I kind of like to be in the spotlight a little more. Um, <laughs> but it's, you know, the, the, the call is odd. Uh, Matthew probably knows who this person is. It's not like Jesus has this magical power over him and says, follow me, and everybody loses their ability to think for themselves. I mean, so, you know, it's there's something else. Going, there's a bigger story there, probably. But still, Matthew is leaving uh, um, a, an interesting position quite literally. I mean, he's literally occupying a toll booth. Yeah. Um, that's probably there to to tax people who are transporting fish and things like that, you know. And so you'd like to you'd like to veer around his booth <laughs> if you were transporting goods. Um, but then it, you know, the the story becomes a, a microcosm really of of what is so offensive about Jesus. It's he's not I don't, you know, at the end of the day, why do they kill him is always a good question to ask when you're reading through the Gospels. And this is part of it is it's just, it doesn't square with expectations. It's not that the Pharisees are necessarily bad people or evil people here. It's not what Matthew was getting at. 
but why would somebody who's so interested in in the in these holy things and in encountering God and knowing God, what is he doing eating with those losers? Like it's just it just doesn't square. And that's and so much of his ministry is is like that. And that's not a criticism of Judaism. It's not even necessarily a criticism of the ruling class. It just shows a way in which he is um well, doing what he says. He hasn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. Um, and after a while, like it's really annoying in any culture, in any religious system, to folks who uh, like a little more stability. And have been following the rules, been expecting that what they're doing, like it's always been done. And then all of a sudden you get someone who is not concerned with status in the way that society says we are given status is not concerned with the um, hierarchy, the way that we've been taught to deal with hierarchy, but is genuinely compelling to all the people, all the people. And so the folks that are making a ton of money with the government and the, bo uh, and the folks who uh, the government is oppressing those are the people that Jesus reaches out to and they both say, yeah, I want some of that. It appears that he's dragging the holiness of God through the mud, I think to some people. And that's, uh, uh, and why wouldn't that make people upset? I mean, if that's indeed what he's doing, he's not, but it's what he appears that he's doing. I just love that imagery after, you know, the creation last week where, you know, God plays around in the dirt and, so why wouldn't God continue to be dragged through the mud? Yeah, I think uh, also the, I find it really interesting, like what you were talking about at the beginning, Matt, of, uh, of Matthew was not called a tax collector. Well, I mean, he is, but, but he's sitting at the tax collection station or at the booth and, and, so to there's this there's this really sort of interesting visual I get of of here he is behind that booth collecting taxes for the Roman Empire and and then to come out from behind that booth and follow Jesus. Uh, there's that a visual there that I find really striking of what are you you know what are you leaving behind or what are you choosing to follow and and then no longer be in this kind of uh you know in this in this job so to speak and so uh i there's something about that i find really compelling and much more visual than than you know he was a tax collector and so it it gives you a, it, i think homiletically it invites you into you know, what booth are you sitting behind? What, what kind of space are you occupying? What place are, do you find yourself that you have to then stand up and walk from out, from behind to follow Jesus? And I think that that's something that I, I would maybe explore imaginatively in a sermon. I think the other thing too, that it, it, it's a very simple question, but why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? How would we answer that? Why, why, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And that I also find a very compelling homiletical direction. How would we answer that? What is the answer to that? And, and, and we get some of an answer here a little bit, but uh, in part because Jesus is called not in a, calls not the righteous, but the sinners. But, but what, what theologically is behind that? How will we answer that? And, and then, and it's a great question. It's a great question to re-enter into Matthew and Matthew's theological themes and Ma Matthew's portrait of who Jesus is and what going back to the, going back to the, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And so I think it could be a really good entry in getting people's heads around Matthew's theological and Christological world as well. And following that image, what happens to us? I didn't mean to say follow, but um, uh, with that image, what, what happens to us when we follow Jesus? What we have here is that Matthew threw a party for the folks that 
he hung out with. He didn't say, okay, I'm abandoning this oppressive role, if I can call it that, and the people that I knew. It's, I'm abandoning this oppressive role and I'm going to invite the people that are doing that to meet the one that compelled me to leave that role. And, and so that becomes a, a one answer to, to why is Jesus hanging out with these people? Because we brought them to Jesus because they were the people we hung out with, because they were the people we loved and Jesus didn't abandon them. We've kind of missed the second paragraph of this story as well so far, which is a real scene change. Um, yeah, yeah. It's not my favorite. I, I think Mark had a much better version of this story. And I so I personally will confess, I think I Matthew messes it up a bit by omitting some details, but it's still, a, of course, a, a worthy story and, and and one that people need to um, need to go deeper into if they don't know it already. Anything we want to say about that before we move on? I'll just say... I, I appreciate, I, I agree, I, I love the longer version in the shortest gospel, um, but I, I think it also draws our attention to while we want to be attentive to what it is each writer is uh, in their larger composition trying to say about who God is and what God in Christ is doing in the world, um, that it takes all of those perspectives to get the full encounter or experience of who God is and what God in Christ is doing in the world. And this becomes a perfect example of a confirmation of an event, but a fullness of perspective when the agenda of the writer is to convey something more or different than, uh, than a, from the other writers. Okay. I would just say one quick thing if people were like, what am I going to do with this text? I, the, the, um, the language about faith <clears throat> is so important in part, in part because it's what makes healing stories, <clears throat> excuse me, difficult to preach because it makes it sound like somehow healing is a reward for sufficient level of faith, which I'm not, I'm, I'm convinced that's not what this text is about. But when Jesus says to the woman suffering from the hemorrhage, your, your faith has made you well, your faith has, has saved you. Um, the only faith she confesses is if I touch his cloak, I will be made well. Right? It's not, it's not doctrinal. <laughs> She's not promising to get up and follow him. You know, it, it's just simply faith looks more like desperation in her case than it looks like a well-reasoned worldview. And so I just would want to lift that up as a, that too is faith doesn't have to have the quote unquote theological sophistication that nerds like us talk about all day long. But anyway, I do, I, nerds, do, I, do have, I do have one, one homiletical um, um, idea yeah. on this too. And that is um, I preached this once uh, and, and titled the sermon. Um, what makes God laughed? What makes God laugh? Um, and it's um, that they laughed at him when he says, um, a go away for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And um, what th we'll, we'll have another text that we laugh at God and, and at when we, when we, we are in the, the um, Abraham and Sarah story later. But um, what makes God laugh? Just a question. I don't know what yep. folks might want to yep. do with it, but... Yep. There's so much of us laughing at God. Probably calling Matthew. Probably God thought that was hilarious. Well, I think so. Yeah. Well, I think so. Hosea is. Oh, just one one thing about. I just had one thought about the <laughs> faith, the the observation about faith that you had, Matt. There is no faith connected to the leader. Am I reading that correctly? I think so. Not yeah. in Matthew's version. Not in, no. in Matthew's version, right? But yet there's, but yet that that sort of intimation of a, of of willing to take you know he's a leader and he's taking, you know he's he's taking a risk uh, to, um, he's going outside of his known systems, uh, of of what of works and what that imperial system is like and to say that, 
uh, th th say that I'm I'm moving out of that into a different kind of uh, space and and faith place, and so that could be faith too. Anyway, it's a well, similar what he says act, out. It's a sim it's a similar act of desperation. Right. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, what he says out loud to Jesus is very similar to what the woman says in her own mind. In terms yeah. Of yeah, yeah. Well, now Jose is really getting short shrift, but um, well, it's I, it's, it's what Jesus quoted. quotes in in nine, Matthew nine thirteen. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I I say yeah, that's about all I've got for that. <laughs> <laughs> David Garber wrote a great commentary, which everybody yeah. should read. Really helpful to understand yeah. uh, Hosea in general in this passage in particular. Um, and what you know, Hosea is one of I find a very frustrating book because it's got some beautiful language side by side with some pretty ugly symbolism. And so this idea of a, of a God who both heals and punishes is one of these tensions that Hosea makes us walk. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the commentator's reminder that to fully, uh, to fully embrace this, we have to read it in its historical context, not in ours. Um, uh, because I think verse six is a really important verse it, and it, it's an opportunity for us to know that God wants to be known. And, and, and how do we know God? What do we know of God? Um, in some ways, what did we already say about knowing God at Trinity Sunday last week? And then when we, where will we talk about knowing God um, as being ultimately that the relationship God wants to have with us? And, and so to, to put this back in that historical context of a God who wants to be in relationship with us. Well, and again, this could take a sermon in a completely different direction, but to say, what, what difference does it make that that these words are on Jesus lips and, uh, mm. and, you know, that, and how is it, you know, we, we talk about you and I, Joy, you and I talk uh, regularly in our class about preaching the old Testament and, and the different ways that you can preach the old Testament. It doesn't have to be preaching on the text, but to show how the new Testament writers and Jesus own ministry is not understood without their scripture. And so this could be, yeah, you know, an entry into Hosea and what is the, you know, sort of the theological imagination that is, that Jesus is drawing on here when he, when he is contemplating his own ministry and what is it that he came to do and, and, and the God that he is revealing. And so that could be a completely, that's a, that's a different kind of sermon but an important one, and often, and this is something preachers should think about on a pretty regular basis. Where am I showing? Where are we talking about? You know, if one of the one of the aspects of a faithful sermon is to expand theological imagination, uh, this could be a place to do that. All right. So the alternate. Old Testament reading, which begins in Genesis. So it's year A, and this is going to kind of walk through uh, the Old Testament over the course of three years. I'm going to, uh, can, can I share with the two of you, just three of us, the, one of my frustrations with the alternate reading, the, the semi-continuous? Yes. yes. Just between us. Turn off the mic. Just between us. I want to know. Yeah, just between us. It's, okay, nobody listen. Out nobody there. listen. Don't the listen. stories that are selected sometimes because they veer toward the great stories or the great people or the great whatevers, it sometimes can be a temptation to tell the stories for their own sake or to treat this part of the lectionary as um, now we're going to make sure people know the stuff they're supposed to know because they didn't learn it well enough in Sunday school or confirmation. And so we're going, I would urge um, if the microphone were on, I would urge our listeners to think about how do these stories uh, how, how do we make sure that each story conveys something about who God is so that these aren't just like legacy stories about, oh, yeah, these are the people in whose line we stand. There's a truth to that. And that's worth talking about. But do we learn something about God from each of these stories? Because sometimes the stories that get skipped <laughs> in Genesis, I, I think, are a lot more theologically 
either problematic or meaty, you know? And so I find these are great stories. I do think people should know them, but how do we always make sure that we aren't just kind of slipping into a nostalgia or slipping into a, um, Bible literacy. This is like canon. Make sure you know the canon kind mm -hmm. of mentality. So anyway, thanks for listening to me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're yeah. Welcome. No, thanks for sharing that with us. We should probably turn the mic back on and yeah, let's turn that. Can, yeah. yeah let every, let, let everybody else um, remember, we know we're still here. I don't want to get in trouble with the lectionary people. That's the thing. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. No, I no, won't no, tell no. them either. I, I won't either. I won't, but I, won't I think either. that's a, that's a really important reminder, Matt, all in all seriousness, because there is that tendency, I think that, the answer to Bible literacy is just, well, you just need to know more of it. You just need to read it more. You need to know these stories. You need to be reminded of these stories. And that's not, that's not necessarily just being reminded of these stories or to know these stories is not automatically going to translate into people wanting to read the Bible more. <laughs> so it's, it, it, it's, uh, so the, having that lens of what is it that what is it that is being revealed about God uh, and and the the continuity of God, the uh, the um, the God's promises, you know, and God and the characteristics of God, I think is I, I think is a really important corrective. Well, it's, it's what you were saying also, uh, uh, Caroline, uh, in terms of why are we reading any portion of the text? Um, it's that same put it back into uh, and put it back into how Jesus understood it, how the first century Jews would recognize Jesus because they had this hope in God. Um, so for me, um, this um, particular text, um, you've heard me say before that Genesis 1 through 11 becomes the prologue, the whole setup for the entire narrative from creation to new creation. And so what you have is a promise in Genesis 12 made to Abraham, Abram and Sarai that God loves the world. That would be the world that has just been scattered uh, in Genesis 11, that that this promise that is being made is, is not merely for um, the people that will become known as Israel. Israel is God's vehicle for loving the whole world. And so it's about God's love for the world and how God is not giving up even though those prologue stories are humanity walking away from God's intention, humanity walking away from God's good, humanity walking away from God. And yet we have this God who is faithful to say, my intention for you is very good. And I'm not going to give up on that no matter what you do. Wow. That's a God that I, I want to, I want to, to be close with because I keep messing up. And then the challenge is I want to live into the responsibility that has been assigned to me. I want to accept my blessing so that others might be blessed, not by me, but by the God who blessed me. That's what this story theologically invites us to rehearse. Yeah. I really appreciate that joy. I think I would call, I would, if I were going to title this sermon, and preach on this text, I would call it hashtag blessed. And, mm. and because how, what do we do with that? You can, it, it, the, the prevalence, right. Of that concept of being blessed and, to, and yeah. And, but yet how future oriented it is and oriented it is and how it has everything to do with how your relationship with God and that being blessed by God is integral to God's, yeah, God's love for the world, and uh, and so and th that it's and it's not just that you are, you know, you it's not that you're just carrying on that blessing, but you're but God is relying on you. <laughs> to, there's a there's a there's a relationship there that is being borne out in this blessing. And um, I think, I know I've mentioned this before, I'm sure I did last time we had this text, but 
This was my mother's, uh, this was my mother's theological mantra or her life mantra. She always felt that she was blessed to be a blessing. And it's on her, it's on her tombstone, her, her grave marker. And, uh, and I, it, w- it was really very meaningful to see how she did that in her life, to, to embody uh, a theological <laughs> claim, right, so deeply and um, how she kept coming back to that and how she could, you know, connect the, that sense of that, that knowing of God's love and, but how is it always looking for where and how she's embodying it in her life. It was, it's a very powerful thing to, and meaningful thing to witness in her life. Yeah. Following from the the things that you just, both of you just said about the response, it will, it'll be noteworthy that Abram and his people do a pretty poor job of, (laughs) of following through perfectly. Right. But God continues to, and they continue to, to go. I, I, I think it's, it's a great place to start <laughs> the 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 survey through through the Old Testament. God doesn't appear to Abram and say, uh, "Hey, I'm God, worship me." God doesn't appear to and say, "Hey, I'm God, clean up your life." God says, "Hey, essentially, I'm you know paraphrasing. Uh, hey, I'm God. I want to give you a lot of stuff. That what comes out first is promise. It's not accusation. It's not." kind of divine jealousy. It's, I am going to uh, bless you. I'm going to give you uh, these things. And Abram's response isn't even faith yet. That's not even mentioned until Genesis 15. Abram went, <laughs> as the Lord told him. Like that's the that's the response, which I think a preacher needs to make it clear. This is incredibly risky to leave his kindred, <laughs> his country. He's going to get killed. I mean, he probably takes a small army with him. He's got to take somebody with him. But this is incredibly dangerous given the sociology of, of the time that's imagined here. And so it's in some ways similar to what we saw in Matthew 9 with the leader and the woman who are both unnamed, that their quote unquote faith is risky. Uh, risky, uh, even with Matthew, right? All he does is gets up and follows Jesus. Uh, it's also a great pairing with Romans 4, um, which. Yeah. Yeah, serendipitously happens. I, we might need to, uh, given time, we might need to tread lightly over Psalm fifty, especially since I believe Rolf Jacobson, our friend, is writing on it. And yeah, I would point people to the commentary and yes. and uh, <laughs> unless you want to say something, all right? Because Romans also demands so much time. This is really a feast of riches this Sunday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, and it and because also this is the first of you know, 15 Sundays on Romans. So do- well, I'm sure some people want to preach that because it's yeah. Romans, yeah. but preaching epistles is difficult. Is it not? It is. You two yeah. teach preaching. I don't know what I'm doing. You two are the It's so hard. <laughs> the it's so hard in the epistles because of the way we've received them. Um, Matt, you set us up well for this. Um, um, God's call doesn't come um follow these rules. God's call doesn't come uh, in in the sense of, you know, just worship me. It's promise. And so understanding that the encounter with Jesus, which is why these letters are being written, these, these rumors of the resurrection have been spreading and people are telling these stories over and over again. And Paul is, is heading himself to this community with these stories, with these, with this truth. And it's a promise. And we only understand this promise if we put it back in the promises of ancient Israel, that they've been waiting for this reality. And as you said, Matt, they've gotten it wrong over and over again. And and Hosea points that out. Hosea is that story of getting it wrong over and over again. And so it's it's a microcosm of that, which is what the whole of the promise to Israel is, that God has made this promise. Humanity keeps walking out on it. God keeps making this promise. And so it is in that context that we should preach the epistles, not for the rules that we pull out, but for the context 
in why is Paul communicating to this people? And what do these words say that are continuous with what God has been doing all along? And this one begins that the promise didn't come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through righteousness. And how is that righteousness made evident? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, um, Abraham's so important for this letter. And so again, to whom is Paul writing? I, I assume it's, these are probably mixed communities of both Gentile and Jewish believers, but the Gentiles probably know something about Judaism and, and Old Testament history. Um, and he's probably trying to call these communities based on chapter 14 and 15 into some kind of a mutual forbearance, into some kind of a, a way of getting along. But he does that through a theological story that depends upon Abram or Abraham and Sarah. And so that line, hoping against hope, uh, he believed that he would become the father of many nations according to what was said. Um, again, it takes me back to the risk of Abram's decision. It takes me back to the risk of the cross as Paul understands that, as Jesus doing something that seems really, really insane, um, but does it out of this kind of deeply costly commitment, this deeply costly faithfulness that Paul sees Christ enacting all for the sake of <clears throat> hope in what God promises, right? When whatever this outcome uh, is, is going to be. And I think too, that, that we remember, we remember that, uh, this is to, when we talk about this, when we're teaching preaching, right, that the epistles are challenging because we're only hearing one side of the story. Like we don't know, <laughs> you know, and, 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 but for, in this case, of course, this is to a community that, uh, that to Rome that Paul didn't found and Paul doesn't have a relationship with. So he's, I think that's important that he's making a case for God's righteousness. Uh, he's making a case for God's righteousness for all. And, and then, and this is the story that he banks on, you know, this is the story that, this is the story that he grounds that righteousness in and which rhetorically is really quite extraordinary uh, but also theologically. And I think that's, that's kind of what a sermon needs to start with, with Romans. And it's easy with Romans to uh, extrapolate these, these passages that we know out of context and, you know, to make Romans be this theological treatise that, you know, because it's, you know, at the end of the Pauline epistles, even though it's the first in the new Testament and, you know, and I, uh, and, and, doesn't seem to have any sort of uh, grounding in a real, you know, a community with whom Jesus or with with which Paul had a relationship. But I think that's where you start is that he's this is the story that that unfolds God's righteousness for Paul that Paul encountered in Jesus. And what difference does that make then for how we know and how we experience God's righteousness now.